This video will show an example of diagnostics for confirmatory factor analysis model. Doing these diagnostics takes a lot of time and a lot of expertise. So this video will be a bit longer than most other videos that I've made. Let's take a look at the problem that we are facing and what kind of data and model we have to get an idea of, of the task ahead. So I'm going to be using a very large sample size. The reason for using a very large sample size is that um, we want to be, under, be able to understand what it means that chi-square will detect trivially small problems. And if your sample size is 200 or 300, then chi-square still has, uh, gives you some wiggle room. So we're going to be using a sample size of 6038. And the data are from PISA survey. This is a survey of students. And uh, we are going to be analyzing a set of three factors, a model of three factors, aspirations, enjoyment and self-concept. I'll, expl I'll explain the variables in a moment. And this has been used to demonstrate nonlinear structural ecosystem modeling. The data are non-normal, so we'll be using robust chi-square statistic. And the workflow here is going to be uh, the measurement validation part of the analysis. So this is typically the part where you spend the most effort once you get the CFA model to fit well, then doing structural regression model is fairly simple because those tend to have uh, less constraints than the CFA model. So the decrease of freedom that you gain when you go from confirmatory factor analysis to structural regression model is fairly small compared to the decrease of freedom of the uh, confirmatory factor analysis model. So a lot more things can go wrong in a confirmatory factor analysis model than in the structural regression model. The chi-square rejects the model and that's the purpose of, of the diagnostics. If chi-square did not reject the model, then unless our sample size is very small, we pretty much know that the model explains the data nearly perfectly. But with, with this sample size, I've never seen a model that would fit perfectly with the first try. So you always need to do some diagnostics. The diagnostics tools that we use are residuals, modification indices, and exploratory factor analysis. I'll use a couple of different kinds of residuals and explain them when I use them. We'll do modifications. So we'll add minor factors. We discover that there's some dimensionality in some of the scales and we address that by adding minor factors or doing bifactor models. We'll also be dropping indicators because some of these scales have uh, more items that we actually need. And sometimes just dropping an indicator that you can't fix is the easiest alternative. Also, in the last step, I will add a couple of error correlations that are going to be trivially small. But that's not uh, the main thing in the diagnostics. The main things that I do are bifactors or minor factors to the model and dropping some of the indicators that are simply uh, dimensional in a way that would be difficult to model. So let's take a look at why the chi-square is important and what are the arguments against the chi-square in this kind of data. I have another video about the chi-square that covers these arguments in more detail. But the main argument against chi-square is that every model that you can possibly fit is going to be an approximation of reality. So reality is more complex than our models. Therefore, all models are approximations and they are incorrect. They can be useful as close approximations, but they are not exactly the same as reality. Therefore, if we have sufficiently large sample size and sufficiently powerful test, which chi-square is, then every model will be rejected ultimately if the sample size just grows up. There may be some uh, some special cases if you have, uh, let's say you have a random number generated from a computer that may be exactly uncorrelated with something else in the population, but beyond that kind of experimental research. If we, we do observational research, then uh, trying to get every correlation fully explained in the data is, is pretty much impossible if you have like an infinite sample size. And we are interested, instead of getting a, a model that fits perfectly, we are interested in understanding to what extent and how the model does not fit and what is the consequence of, of the misfit of the model. And then we make an informed decision on what to do. And uh, this is basically uh, the, the thing that I follow. There are 
two extreme ways of how people address chi-square. Again, this is an argument that I explain more in another video. The one of these extremes is that models with significant chi-square are wrong and they should not be published because we don't want to be publishing wrong models. But this is, uh, this is not a very, very productive approach because uh, ultimately if you have uh, like a survey data set, we are pretty much uh, guaranteed to be not able to explain all the different processes that people go through when they answer to those questions. We are simply uh, trying to approximate the survey response process as well as possible and then say something about theory using those data. And uh, if we go uh, to this road, we will also lose information that we could learn from trivially misspecified models. So if the model is misspecified only a little, then uh, the estimates that we have, if they are biased by 1% or, or 0.5% or even less, then uh, it's better to use those slightly biased estimates than something than not using the results at all. Then the other uh, extreme is that we completely ignore the chi-square, we just look at approximate fit indices. If CFI is, is greater than 0.9, then we, are, we have a well-fitting model. And if it's less than 0.9, then, then we do some stuff. But that's not very good approach either, because these alternative fit indices, they are, they are quite loose. So CFI 0.9 is not that strict of a benchmark. And also trying to quantify the misfit with a single number hides a lot of nuances and lots of things that we could actually possibly address. So it's possible that one of these uh, summary indices of model fit show that there is no, on average not much misspecification, but th that hides uh, one particular uh, problematic part of the model and other parts are, are pretty okay. So we need to do something. We need to respect the chi-square. If chi-square tells that our model is not correct, we need to understand in which way it is not correct. And that requires that we do diagnostics. We need to understand the sources of misfit and possibly to do diagnostics. We need to do sensitivity analysis. So we need to understand how much the misfit or how much the possible changes that we could do to the model affects the results. If we, we add some things to make the chi-score significant and there is, uh, there is no meaningful difference in, in a correlation that we're interested in, then adding those things to make the chi-score non-significant wouldn't make a difference. And importantly, I'm not going to be using any of the approximate fit indices. I'll print them, print them out just for reference and I'll, I'll say a few words about them, but those are not part of the workflow. We'll just be using chi-score we are going to be using modification indices, residuals, and then exploratory factor analysis. This follows the uh, recommendations by Klein. And uh, basically, uh, we are looking for, for theoretical reasons for adding stuff to the model. So we'll be adding things to the model. And uh, data simply says that we, we could add something. But then whether we actually want to do so, that needs to be justified based on theory. So we will be looking at survey items. And, and then realizing that, well, actually, when we look at the scale, there is some dimensionality that we should have noticed uh, even before running the analysis. In some cases, it's not obvious, but when we have the data that shows that there are two dimensions, we realize, that, okay, yeah, maybe that is the case. So we're not going to be using these approximate indices, but we'll be focusing on, on the theoretical reasons. Why would you like to include something in the model? Let's take a look at the data. So we have three scales. We have enjoyment scale, which has five items. And the items are listed here, called, refers to, referred to as X1 through X5 in the model. And uh, then we have self-concept, which is basically uh, how much you think that you know science things. And uh, six items. You can read more about this uh, survey using these links. So that's the link to the PISA report. And if you want to take a look at the actual forms, this is the link to the forms. And then we have uh, career aspirations in science, four items measuring how much a person would like to work in the science field. And so this is a quick overview and we are going to be feeding this um, data. We're going to be feeding a three-factor model 
along these scale dimensions and then see what happens. And I'll be looking at individual items when I make different decisions on what to do about the model. So let's get started. So this is the first thing that we do is to just run a converter factor analysis of the data. We got 87 degrees of freedom. The robust chi-square is very significant. So uh, the model is not perfect for the data. At this point for reference it is useful to check what are the levels of the alternative fit indices for our data. So uh, the CFI is, is 0 0.9740.69 that is that exceeds the commonly used benchmark of 0.95. AIC and BIC are not useful for model testing so I'll not talk about those there for model comparisons not for model testing and uh, then we have RMSCA the rule of thumb that is that it must be less than 0 0.05 and then we have uh, the confidence interval that's ideally less than 0 0.05 that is the case here and then uh, SRMR, standardized root mean square residual, should be less than 0.05, which it is in this case by a pretty good margin. So if we only look at these uh, alternative fit indices, we would say that this model is okay, we would ignore the chi-score, we wouldn't do any diagnostics and we would proceed. In the end of the video, I'll take a look at whether doing that would actually make a difference. But for now, we'll, we'll do diagnostics to understand the process and at the end of the video, we will have a significant chi-square for the full model with reasonable modifications and a sample size of 6,000. So the, the sample sizes are in the thousands is really not a, a justification for not doing a, looking at the chi-square. You can make the model fit whether you actually want to do so. That's another question that I'll answer in the end of the video. So the approximate or alternative fit indices indicate good fit and we would basically go with whatever we have. But the chi-score rejects the model, so we are in the position of what now? And what we do now is the diagnostics. So the problem is that these average, uh, these indices show an average, so and we have quite a few indicators, quite a few correlations, we have um, 80 some degrees of freedom, so there are lots of small things that could be grossly incorrect that are not really shown because we only look at the average degree of misspecifications. So we have average degree of misfit. We need diagnostics to understand which of the correlations or covariances the model does not explain. The first thing that I do is simply to print out the uh, residual covariance matrix. And here we have it. I have, uh, this is in correlation metric. So uh, they are they are interpreted like correlations here, and uh, when I do this kind of analysis at the office, what I quite often do is that I print out a, like a large A A4 or A3 sheet, and I'll print out the correlation matrix. I'll print out the residual covariance matrix, and then uh, I'll I'll use marker to highlight large correlations and try to understand what is going on. So here I've highlighted uh, with yellow all these uh, residual covariances that are more than 0 0.03 and with red I have highlighted everything that is more than 0 0.05. So we can see if there's a pattern in the data. If there's a pattern that we have a uh, misfit over here but not over here then that indicates that there is a local misspecification around here and we should do something about it. But this is more, more like scattered around, so there are like, like no, no big clusters of misspecification. Maybe X3 has a bit more uh, large residual covariances than X2 for example, but there are no like, like uh, blocks of large covariances. There are individual items X6 and and so on. Another thing that we are be look, we'll look at is whether the distribution of these residual correlations is about normal. So in a well-fitting model the distribution should be normal and well it's, it's close to normal. If there are any peaks on the right hand side or the left hand side then that indicates that there is a like some larger values than what is expected because of chance only. So in large samples these are normally distributed and the chi-score just tells that uh, 
whether that distribution is, is narrow enough that we can attribute it to chance. In this case we cannot. Another thing that I'm looking at here is the correlations within scales. So these are the scale within scale correlations. We can see that uh, the second scale it looks better than the first scale and the third scale. So this indicates that the first scale is more higher residual covariances than the second scale and the third scale has higher covariances. This indicates that there's potential dimensionality here. So there, there is a dimensionality, one or more minor dimensions in the scale that the current model does not explain and therefore some of the correlations are unexplained. Another thing that we could be looking at is the standardized residual covariance matrix. The standardized residual covariance matrix basically takes uh, the residual correlation matrix. So the cover residual covariance is in the correlation metric and then it divides its covariance with uh, its estimated variability. So it's basically uh, we basically calculate like a standard error for each residual covariance and then we divide each residual covariance with that standard error. The standard error quantifies how much each of these residuals would vary from over repeated samples if we were to study the, do this study over and over and over with repeated random samples. So of course residuals uh, they depend on uh, sampling error and we need to quantify the effects of sampling error. So these standardized residuals tell us what is the uh, or how plausible it is that these are due to chance only. So it is kind of like a chi-square test for each individual covariance and these are actually interpreted like, like z-statistics. So if you have a statistic with an absolute value of greater than two, then that would be individually statistically significant. We can see that there are some large values 4.7 here. Uh, there, there are blocks 7s, 4s, 3s. So we have individual correlations that are individually statistically significant. This correlation matrix in standardized form or standardized residual covariance matrix is sometimes more useful than the raw residual covariance matrix because uh, these are uh, larger numbers and it's easier to see patterns in larger numbers than smaller numbers and this is one of the reasons why I'm looking at this. Another thing is that this is uh, this basically tells uh, more directly which of these correlations are going to affect the chi-square. So if we take the, uh, the highest correlation here, higher standardized uh, residual correlation, then uh, that will decrease the chi-square the most. So at least roughly. All right, so we didn't see a particular pattern here in the uh, residual correlations. What we need to do next is to just run an exploratory factor analysis to see what the result will look like. And this is quite often what I do just because running an exporter analysis is very easy to do and it always gives us some data or some results that we did not know in advance. So the exporter factor analysis here what I look at is whether all loadings except the main loading are close to zero. So we can see here that these um, first indicators first five load on one factor the first, uh, the next six load on another factor and then the last four load on the third factor and all the cross loadings are very small. So there's 0.12, that's the largest, but otherwise they are less than 0.01. So if we were to use a, an exploratory factor analysis, we would consider that this would be a, a very clean solution. So we know that the data have approximately three dimensions, but not exactly three. So the chi-square tests if there are exactly three dimensions that explain this data and the answer to that question is no, there is some dimensionality beyond those three main dimensions. But as an approximation, would this be good enough? Well, it depends a bit on the purpose of the study. But let's do the diagnostics and see what it takes to, uh, to get the chi-square to be significant. So the overview of the workflow uh, this far is that uh, we did the diagnostics for the, the large model, but trying to fix a large model by, by looking at it as a, as a large model is, is not easy. So I prefer to uh, break the model into smaller components. 
So if we have over identified factors, which means factors with more than three indicators, then I'll be looking at, at one factor at a time. Or if I, I have uh, over just identified factors, factors with three indicators, then I may be looking at two factors at a time. So we're just looking at a smaller part of the bigger problem and trying to fix those smaller parts first and then return to the bigger problem after we fix those small parts. So let's take a look at the diagnostics that we do for, or for one factor at a time. We have correlation residuals, standardized residuals, modification indices, we apply bifactor models and exploratory factor analysis. The objectives of this analysis in this video is to understand the source of misspecification and to get a non-significant chi-score. I'll talk about uh, whether these objectives make sense in the end of the video. So let's get started with the first factor. So we have the five, item, five items x1, x2, x3 and x4 and we fit the comforter factor analysis the model is rejected. So one factor is not sufficient for explaining these data. So what we do now is that we look at the loadings and we can see that uh, all indicators except x3 estimated the load about the same and um, then we need to understand okay so why does it not load. So we have five degrees of freedom and a chi-square of 152 so this is not even close and in the next factor we actually have nine degrees of freedom and chi-square of 80 initially so that's a lot closer than this one. So ideally they are the test that this thing will be close to the degrees of freedom and once it's about twice the degrees of freedom depending a bit on the degrees of freedom then we'll start getting a, a non-significant chi-square in these small ones. So what we do next is we, we take a look at what correlations we have in the data and uh, what parts of those correlations the model does not explain. So let's take a look at these R results now and uh, we have the items here. So whenever you, you think why do these items correlate and why does the model not explain those correlations you need to be focused on, on what the items actually are. So these are the enjoyment items and we can see that there are some interesting correlations. So we have a, a large residual here and we have a large set of residuals here that are positive and we have negative residuals here. So we have a pattern of two indicators not correlating more than what the model predicts, set of three indicators correlating more what the model predicts and these two sets correlating less with what the model predicts. And this pattern indicates dimensionality. So there are dimensions in the data that the model does not explain. X1 and X2 are about reading. So if we take a look at these, uh, this is more about passive. It's, it's about learning without doing any specifics and this is about reading. And then third, fourth and fifth is something that requires more effort. So you are acquiring new knowledge, you are, you are doing science problems and uh, the, the fifth one is, is pretty generic. But uh, so it's not like like we would have noticed that in advance, but now that we have the results, we can see that may, well maybe there is some dimension along these lines. We can also check exploratory factor analysis of these data. So this is the unrotated exploratory factor analysis. And why this unrotated is that I want to see how much dimensionality there is beyond the main dimension. So the main dimension loadings are here. This is maximum likelihood factor analysis. So the loadings are, are pretty much the same than I had in the converter analysis. And then I want to run a factor analysis on the residuals from, from the arm. Um, the confirmatory analysis. We can see that the first two items load more negatively on the secondary factor, third item not that much and then item four and item five load positively on the secondary factor. And the secondary factor indicates the existence of a secondary dimension. So we need to model this dimensionality in the scale. If we run an exploratory factor analysis using factor rotation we discover that there actually is the, uh, the first two items, one factor, items three, four and five, they load with the second factor, the factors are correlated at 0 0.8. So if we fit a single factor model to the data, then this 0 0.8 is not exactly one and uh, the chi-square detects that the model actually doesn't, does not fully account 
for the dimensionality of the indicators. So uh, what do we do? Options are here. By factor model with reading and doing as, as minor factors. Or we can do one secondary factor reading versus doing which slows positive in x1 and x2 and negatively in x3 and x5 and x4. So the, the second option is basically uh, specifying this kind of um, this kind of factor structure that we had in the initial exploratory factor analysis and, and the secondary factor which loaded positively and negatively. I'm going to be doing the bifactor approach first because that is a bit easier to do. So we'll add a secondary factor for reading loading on x1 and x2 and the factor loading is a constraint to be equal because um, for identification and the secondary factor must be uncorrelated with the primary factor. So I add orthogonal x equals true as an argument to my function call. Let's see the results. So we have a robust chi-square which is non-significant, it is significant so the model is rejected but there's a quite a lot of large difference between the previous model. So the previous robust chi-square was 150 and now we're down at 11. So there's, there's clear dimensionality that we need to account for in the analysis. Another thing that we notice is that the indicators x1 and x2 loadings decrease. So it was about 0.7 something and now it's 0.6 something. And um, these are minor factor loadings are substantial. So normally when we want to have a minor factor, when you add a minor factor to the model, ideally we would have the minor factor to load, load just uh, not, that, not as strongly on, on the, as the main factor, just to be able to call it a minor factor, but this, this is a pretty substantial loading. Why do these indicator loadings decrease? To understand that, let's take a look at the Venn diagram. So this is the Venn diagram and we added a minor factor of reading. So this is basically uh, the blue area here. And then we have the general factor and then we have the factor enjoyment. But because we don't have, or we have the, the, the secondary minor factor for doing, but because we actually did not add the doing factor here, then this, this factor, this general factor of enjoyment actually includes the enjoyment factor as well as the, the doing factor. And for that reason, these are x1 and x2 load with smaller coefficients because they don't correlate with the doing factor. So that's the, that's how, well, the reason why these are, these are uh, lower. All right, let's take a look at the, uh, the residuals then. So the residuals are here. So we have the, uh, the observed covariances, residuals, and then standardized residuals. We have x1, x2 correlation explained perfectly because we added a minor factor that explains that correlation perfectly. And all these here indicate the, the dictator of misfit. But we knew that the model is not going to fit well because we identified the reading factor and doing factor and we only added one. We can only also take a look at modification indices. So these modification indices tell us that maybe we should uh, add x4 as an indicator for reading, uh, which wouldn't make much sense, x3, x5, x3 and x4 correlations and, and so on. If we take a look at these um, items, we can also think that okay, so x3, x4, x5, they are problematic. We are trying to address that by adding a secondary factor for doing that loads, that loads on those indicators. So we add a secondary factor for doing and now we have two minor factors. We run the model and we are winners, we got uh, a non-significant chi-score with one degree of freedom. Now, the model is not rejected. So do we use this model or do we do something else? Let's take a look at the estimates. So um, the estimated factor loadings here, once we added the, the doing factor, now the, uh, the x1 and x2 load highly or, or higher on the main factor, which just indicates that the doing factor is now no longer contaminating the main factor. But some things that we, uh, we notice is that this is a, a pretty large loading. So that's a pretty large loading for a minor factor. And uh, 
So this, this minor factor actually explain uh, some degree of the data. We would like that explanation to be uh, a bit level of explanation to be a bit lower. So I'm gonna try the other option as well. So um, the residuals look good. There are some, some, but this this could be attributed like to chance only. So I'm gonna try the other option. So I'm gonna do also a secondary factor that loads on all the items. It loads on the first uh, two items positively and the last three items negatively. So I will add this constraint here. And this constraint uh, forces convergence. If we don't add the constraint, then the model will not converge. The model is not identified for the same reason that an exploratory factor analysis is not identified, but can be rotated to get equivalent solutions. But we will not care about that for now, because it will be identified once we embed this factor into a larger model that contains other factors as well. So how does the model fit the data? Well, it can be tested because it's not identified. So this is not testable model. But what we can uh, see is that the factor loadings here are, are look good. And then importantly, the minor factor loadings are smaller than in the previous model. So we don't have the large loading for for x4 anymore and uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go with this model so and but we have to remember that this is not identified so these loadings may change and we need to uh, revisit the loadings once we have this model in uh, a larger context so the, the fact that the model is not identified at this point is not problematic of course, if we, this was our final model and then it's not identified, then we, that would be a big, big problem for us. But we know that this will be identified later. And we were just uh, trying to see if this kind of model would explain the data and all non-identified models with the same constraints will explain the data equally well. So we're not really that interested in the specific values at this point. We'll uh, identify them later. So summary this far, what have we done? So uh, the full model did not fit the data and uh, exploratory factor analysis indicated the existence of quite clean three-dimensional solution. Diagnostics one factor at a time. The first factor showed dimensionality. We had reading versus doing and we needed to address that dimensionally somehow. Alternative one was to add two minor factors, uh, make it a bifactor model, reading factor and doing factor. Another alternative was to add this uh, reading or doing factor that loads on all items. That is uh, similar to running an exploratory factor analysis, which is not rotated. So you first take uh, the, the main dimension and then you take uh, whatever uh, varia covariation is remaining after the first dimension and then factor analyze that. And that's the, t that's the, uh, the choice that we've made because the, the loadings on that secondary factor were smaller than in the bifactor case. Then we proceed to the next two factors. And these next two factors, we need to do a bit of different diagnostics. Then we uh, do the full model and then we uh, decide what to report and which model actually to retain in our final analysis, final interpretation. So let's take a look at the second factor. So we have six items here and this is the R code for the analysis. Before we actually run the analysis, let's take a look at uh, these items and how they differ. Because uh, we can clearly see that the first item is, is more future looking than the others. So the first item X6 is about what do you feel about the future? And items 7 through 10 are like the present and the past. Then item X7, I can usually give good answers tests is, is more objective, more fact-based than the others. So these others are more like, like assessments of how do I assess myself and this is more, more about facts. So have I been able to perform well in the past? And then these are uh, x8 through x11. They are more about your feeling of yourself at current time or in the past. So they are, we could expect them to be uh, slightly different from x6 and x7. Let's take a look at the analysis. So this is our, our results. The first thing we note, the mod model is rejected. So the chi-score is significant. The loadings of the first two items are a bit lower than 8, 9 and 11. And that's or, or 
10 and that was expected because they were slightly different than, than these other items. So, so what do we do? Well, let's take a look at an exploratory factor analysis first. So we run the main factor here and it loads on all items except x11 and the second factor only loads on x11. So there is no clear dimensionality. Once we start to have these factors in an exploratory analysis that only explain one indicator, then we know that there is no meaningful factor structure beyond a specific number of factors. So we know that there is no clear dimensionality this time and we can actually see it from, uh, from this chi-square. So chi-square with 9 degrees of freedom and 81 that is a lot closer fit than we had before when we had 5 degrees of freedom initially and 150 chi-square. So the, the starting point is already much more unidimensional than in the previous scale. So let's, let's move on. No clear dimensionality, then we inspect the, the uh, residuals. So we have the, uh, the, the sample statistics, residuals in correlation metric, and then standardized residuals. I have highlighted values that are greater than 2 with yellow and values that are greater than 4 with red just to see the pattern in the residuals. So, so what do we uh, observe? We observe that x6 and x7 correlations are lower than with the other indicators and that's, that's natural because they measure a slightly different thing than the others. So there's the, uh, the future looking dimension and then there's the fact dimension compared to the present, the feeling of the present. There is no clear pattern in the residuals. Well, we can see that uh, X10 and X11 have, uh, or X11 has the most, these very large residuals, then X6 has large residuals as well. So what do we need to do? Let's take a look at the modification indices because it's not clear at this point what we should do. And modification indices simply tell us that we should allow X10 and x11 or x8 and x11 11 to correlate and if we take a look at x10 and x11 and we take a look at these items why do they correlate well uh, both have the word understanding here so x10 and x10 are about understanding and then x8 and x9 are more about whether it whether you learn quickly so a person can learn quickly but without really understanding or a person can really understand things but not be that quick of a learner so there is a dimensionality in your learning and that dimensionality is shown here in the scale and it's shown in the modification index. So we can also see the x10, x11 correlation here. So we have, uh, that's the large positive correlation, large positive residual. And then we can take a look at, okay, so what's the actual observed correlation? And, and now there's an interesting thing. So, so uh, why is this correlation 0.495, why is it uh, underestimated? So uh, this is not, not a very large correlation. If it was a larger correlation than others, then we could say that maybe there is dimensionality in the data. But this 0.495 is actually smaller than 0.522, that's right, ne right next to it, and smaller than any of these. So why is this particular value overestimated by so much? We need to understand that the implied correlation is a product of, of these two factor loadings of x10 and x11. And x11 is estimated to be very reliable, but x10 less so. So why is x10 estimated to be uh, estimated to load a bit less on uh, the factor than x11? And this small loading of x10 is actually what causes this positive uh, residual covariance. The implied covariances again is the product of these two loadings. Okay, so, so why is there uh, such small reliability value on X10? The reason is that X10 correlates very little with, X, with uh, X6 and X7. So these correlations X6 and X7 with X10 explain why the factor loading is small and the small factor loading explains this large residual covariance. So um, what do we do? Well, we have uh, some options. I will try dropping x6 from the model. So uh, that's because x6 is uh, 
more uh, future looking than others. So it is really different from others. It's uh, like extent, there is no real cl cl clear reason to, uh, to, to say that it is different from others. So it's um, easier to justify that we drop x6 because it is uh, different from these others. And then uh, we drop that and we'll see what happens. That will likely increase the reliability estimate of x10 and also decrease this uh, residual covariance. So let's take a look at what happens. So we run without x6 and we get a uh, significant chi-square model, model is rejected and uh, now what? So uh, the loading of x10 increased a little but, but not much and when we take a look at the residuals we can see the same pattern here x10 x11 correlation is not fully explained by the model so that is large then x8 and x9 have also uh, large negative correlations. If we take a look at modification indices, the modification indices simply say that well we should free these correlations that we have uh, highlighted so that's not very useful. Let's take a look at the similar analysis of the loadings and uh, the actual uh, items here and so we have the loading of x10 and why is the loading so low? It is low because there is the correlation of 0.396 which are uh, with x7 which uh, pulls the reliability or, or factor loading of both x7 and x10 low and that causes the, uh, the, residual, the residual covariance to be large. Now we need to start thinking about uh, what do we do about this. There is no clear uh, reason to add things, to add dimensions to the model. In the previous scale there was clear dimensionality here, not really. So do we drop items and if we start dropping items to get the model to fit, we need to understand what is the, uh, the meaning of the concept. So um, what is the meaning of self-concept and that's, that's one definition from Wikipedia. And then uh, does the uh, definition of the concept give us any information on, on if some of these items are not compatible with that definition or not. And looking at the, the definition there is like no clear mismatch between any of these indicators and the definition. So that does not really really help at, that, at this point. So what, we'll, what I will now try to do is that uh, because uh, these, these capture quite uh, different facets. X6 and X7 were slightly different from others. So if I drop X7, then I will have very homogeneous set of indicators. And then if we look at these, uh, what are the problematic items? X7 is actually, it's actually explained really well by the models. So the residuals are small. We have problems with X8, X9 and X10. So uh, we are going to be dropping try dropping x10 because if we drop x10 we don't really lose much because it's about the perception of, of one's capabilities at current time instead of being future looking or fact based like the first two indicators. So we'll be dropping x10 from the model and see what happens. And uh, now we get a significant non-significant chi-score so the model is not rejected with the two degrees of freedom we uh, declare victory for this factor and then we move on. Now is this the right way of, of doing it? So we drop two indicators. When we drop two indicators we lose information and uh, it is in principle it, it is possible and I was actually able to get the model with the six indicators that fits the data but the model gets really messy. So if we want to communicate our research results to some other people then it's easier to go with simpler models that are adequate. And if we really want to have a significant chi-square, in this case, dropping two indicators will get that, sorry, non-significant chi-square, then dropping two indicators will get us to that point. And if we compare the indicators that we dropped, x10 and x6, then we don't really lose anything important considering the definition of self-concept. So we can drop indicators as long as the indicators as a set contain uh, or cover the, uh, cover the concept so we don't lack content validity and as long as we have enough 
indicators to identify the model. So a four factor indicator is four indicator factor is pretty good because it, it's testable and then with 6000 observations chi-score does not reject this model. So summary this one we tried the full model the chi-score did not uh, rejected the model so it need not fit perfectly exploratory factor analysis looked good so it gave us some hope that we can actually find a well-fitting model then we do diagnostics one factor at a time first factor so dimensionality we added a secondary factor to that first factor second factor did not have a clear reason to misfit and the degree of misfit originally was not as bad as for the first model so if we look at the actual the residual covariance values they were not that large to start with so we could have just perhaps gone with the uh, full six indicator set and maybe that wouldn't have made a big difference we'll take a look at that in the end of the video the second factor was fixed by dropping two problematic indicators so basically we, we omitted information and then the model was able to explain what remained in the data and it's also possible to get a well-fitting model using the six indicators but that gets a bit messy so I didn't want to do that and include that in the video. Now we'll proceed to the final factor and then we'll do the test of the full model using these modifications. So the final factor has four indicators. If we drop any of these indicators this model will become just identified and we know that it will fit the data perfectly. And let's say let's take a look at what the results show. The chi-square shows no model does not fit it's rejected. We need to now understand what is the reason and if we take a look at these, these uh, loadings y2 loads highly y4 not so much but they don't really help us that much. Let's take a look at uh, the uh, residuals. So the, the pattern of residuals shows that we have a, a large uh, a positive correlation here between y1 and y2 we can take a look at the standardized loadings it's easier to see the pattern then we have a, a, a positive correlation here between y3 and y4 and then as a set y2 and y y1 and y2 are negatively correlated with y3 and y4 as a set so all these are are not are are negative we also have y1 and y4 that are not as highly correlated as the other indicators so this kind of pattern indicates dimensionality and the small correlation here between y1 and y2 indicates that it is specifically y1 and y4 that measure two different things. And now we need to look at the items, what the actual items are to understand what the y1 and y4 measures represent. So uh, y4 is more about working on projects and y1 is more about having a career in science. So, so what do we do? We, we proceed and we take a look at modification indices. Then modification indices basically show that add a correlation between y3 and y4, add a correlation between y1 and y2. This is equivalent to adding a minor factor for y1, y2 or minor factor for y1, y3, y4. And uh, that's what the modification indices show. Then we uh, do an exploratory factor analysis and I'll show the rotated solution. So this is the rotated solution. We see the first two factors indicators loading on the first factor, y3 and y4 loading on, on the second factor, but y2 and y3 uh, load, uh, they cross load a bit. A bit. So that is uh, a non-trivial cross loading for, for both. So um, what's the dimensionality? We have y1 and y2 more directly about the carrier y3 and y4 more about doing science and now our scale was about about carrier aspirations these um, modification indices simply so the, the factors the minor factors so uh, our options are to use a bifactor model to try to uh, modify to to uh, explain these two dimensions or we can just drop y4 the reason for dropping y4 is that uh, the carrier aspirations in science is more about carrier and y1 is more about carrier than y4 so if we drop y4 then we will get a, a unidimensional solution because the model will be just identified it will fit perfectly and if the factor loadings are acceptable then we could go for that model 
we can see here that y3 loads cross loads on the first factor quite heavily so we could argue that uh, whatever is in the y4 will go to the uniqueness element of y3 and it does not cause misfit in the model. So let's take a look at uh, the model that we chose. It's not testable, decrease of freedom is zero because it's just identified. So we just look at the factor loadings. The estimated factor loadings are, look pretty good. Y3 because it loads on the secondary dimension, it has higher uniqueness than the others, but that's not really a, a big problem. So 0.7, no one is going to complain about that reliability in a conservative factor analysis model. So summary this far. So we have been able to get all the factors to fit individually or be non-testable, which with degrees of freedom of zero. Now we're going to be taking uh, the factors together into a large, larger confirmation factor analysis model where uh, we, we take these modified factors and we put it back together. So the idea was that we first test the full model, it does not fit, we take it apart, we fix the individual part and now we put the parts back together. So this is the putting back together. So we have uh, the, the read or do minor factor, otherwise the factors are the same. We dropped uh, some in, one indicator from aspirations and two indicators from self-concept. And let's see what they are, the chi-square tells us. So do we, are we winners or not? No, we are not winners and the model, model is rejected. So uh, we need to do something about it. We can now do an expert factor analysis to get some hope. So the EFA of these items shows a pretty clean solution, but that's expected because the original solution was pretty clean. But, and we just dropped a few indicators, it should not affect the model at all. So the data have approximately three dimensions. Now the largest cross-loading is, is 0.09, it was 0.112 in the original EFA, and, and we just dropped the cross-loading items, so that's, that's good. And now let's take a look at the individual items. So what can we say about the individual items based on the exploratory factor analysis? So this is the full set of items here. And uh, let's take a look at the individual items. So first item that does not behave well is X3. X3 here does not have a high loading on the first factor and it has cross loadings on the factor 2 and factor 3. Why? is x3 different? Well, that is uh, about, about doing these problems. So when we analyze the first scale, we noticed that uh, we had the doing versus uh, reading. And this is, this is more about doing than the others. And in, in this model, we don't have the secondary factor for reading versus doing. So that's the reason why it does not fit. Then we had uh, x7 and x7 is uh, is more objective. So it was different from the other uh, self-concept scales in that these are others are more about how do I see myself. This is more about about facts. Have I been able to perform well in the past and per person would have like an objective way of saying something to that question. Then uh, we have x10 which loads at less than 0.7 again but here the cross loadings are not that high. So maybe we, we keep that in the model and, and dropping X7 and X10 would be a bit problematic as well. If we drop both, then we only have two items in the, in the uh, analysis. The Y items, Y1, Y2 and Y3, they load highly on the factor where they're supposed to load and there are no cross loadings. So these cross loadings are practically zero. Then we take a look at the, uh, the residuals and mark large residuals with red and larges with yellow, we can see that the item X3 is, is the one that cross loads or, or has the highest residuals even after the full CFA. And, and when we take a look at the items, that's about the problems. So other items were about learning, this is about problems. And if you like to do science problems, then that probably correlates with uh, liking to do those when you are an adult as well, which is part of the aspiration scale. So there is this, uh, this X3, it could actually measure in, in a way the same thing that the aspiration scale measures when uh, it asks you whether you want to do science problems when you uh, grow up to be an adult. So uh, because of that cross-loading, we could of 
of course model it but we have enough indicators and and trying to get a model that explains all these correlations will be quite difficult so we'll just take the easy road and we'll drop x3 from the analysis so we still have our uh, three indicators or four indicators for the for the first factor x1 x2 x4 and x5 so dropping one we are still uh, four indicators so that that's good so we can we can do dropping of x3 let's take a look at the factor analysis now so this is our our second uh, modified full factor analysis model the chi score tells us that we are not winners yet so our model is rejected but we are getting closer so the uh, the test statistic goes smaller of course the decrease of freedom goes smaller as well but that's uh, what happens when we simplify the model we drop constraints we get better fit but also with there's less things to be tested now when we take a look at the residuals there's a lot less red here and i'm gonna pull up the items again and now what do we do so we can see that uh x7 has the largest loading x4 has the largest loading so we could consider dropping x7 or x4 just to to get them all of the fit and uh that and then we need to consider what do we lose if we drop x4 so if we drop x4 then we only have three indicators of enjoyment but we had two factors to explain those those uh, three indicators so that's we are going to be seriously overfitting the model if we drop x4 if we drop x7 this could be dropped because it's it's more objective so it's it's different from the others so the other aspect uh, self-concept items were more about feeling and this is more objective so that would be a reason for dropping it it's a bit different from the other self-concept items also the self-concept scale had four items but no minor dimensions so if we drop x7 then that factor is still going to be identified itself without information from the other model and that produces more stable results so we're going to be dropping x4 on these grounds and then let's take a look at the model so this is our, our model we have dropped indicators so we have four indicators for enjoyment we have a, a by factor for that four indicator set and three indicators for self-concept and aspiration so those are just identified three indicators still pretty good and what does the chi-square say no victory but we're getting closer so this is significant i'm always rejected now let's print the residuals we can see that now when we look at this individual standardized coefficients then uh, we have no large standardized residuals anymore so everything is below four in absolute value so they are still significant but not as large as before then we can also ask the question that when we look at the absolute magnitude of the correlation residuals the largest one that we have is 0 0.40 so is it really a big concern that there is a, a small 0 0.04 correlation that the model doesn't ex explain is that correlation already trivial so these are very close to zero they are not exactly zero so would this uh, qualify as as trivial misspecification that is just detected by the chi-square because the sample size is 6000 so if you have a, a sample size of 6000 then 0 0.04 is statistically significantly different from zero but it is, is it meaningfully different from zero? That's an entirely different question. Let's take a look at the residual, uh, residuals and modification indices. The modification indices simply say that, well, I had um, a correlation between X4 and uh, X11 because this is the, uh, the largest residual. And uh, if we add that correlation, then the expected estimate for that correlation is going to be 0 0.03. So should we add a, mod, a correlation to the model where <coughs> the parameter value for that correlation will be that small? Can we just assume that zero is a good enough approximation for this? Or do we really need to add this, this to the model? What I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a bit of data mining and then uh, we'll see the end result. So I'll do uh, a couple of rounds. I'll add the correlation here 
to the model. And I'm always going to be picking the largest of these modification indices and an error correlation added to the model and see what happens. I'm going to do this for four rounds and we got four error covariances here and model is not rejected. So we did a bit of data mining in the end. Uh, I, do, I tried to come up with explanations for those correlations but I really couldn't and I really couldn't come up with minor factors. But then again if we take a look at these correlations they are trivially small. So we add four correlations that are not driven by theory but the correlations are meaningless. So these correlations you would if you had sample size of 6000 you wouldn't notice these correlations with plain eyes. So they make absolutely no difference for, for most research scenarios. So these correlations are small and therefore I think at least myself I think that doing this adding these correlations purely based on this uh, data mining approach would be okay because these don't really really matter they're so small. All right they, let's take a look at the, the model. So we have uh, estimates that are reasonable the factual loadings are what we expect and uh, there's a bit higher loading in, in a minor factor a bit higher of what I would like but I can live with that the other loadings are small and then the factor correlations are are pretty high and that's expected based on theory. So let's do model comparisons that's the R code if someone wants to replicate this analysis and we're going to be comparing uh, five confirmatory factor analysis models. So we have the full CFA so this is the original model this was the CFA after factor level diagnostics so we identified uh, the secondary by factor in the first scale we dropped indicators from the second and third scale and then we dropped indicator three in the third model indicator seven in the fourth model and then we did data mining in the final model to get a non-significant chi-square. Now the question is okay which should we, which should we use? So uh, we could go for the, um, the final model on the basis that it is non-significant according to the chi-square test. But then again we had to do a bit of data mining and uh, after dropping x3 the residuals were already very very small. So we had a very well fitting model. There were only trivial correlations but they were small because, and they were significant because of chi-square power in large samples. So maybe uh, x, this model where we drop x3 would be acceptable and we don't need to go to the data mining. Or we, maybe we pick the, uh, the x7 because where we drop that because here we basically we justified still this action it is not purely data mining. And the second question is uh, did the model modifications make a difference? So we're interested in estimating the factor correlations. So are there meaningful differences between these factor correlations? If we look at the original converter factor analysis model and then the final one there's a minus 10% difference. So minus 10% probably makes a difference for many people. And uh, that just shows that when we do the full CFA, even if our all our alternative fit indices look good, it does not guarantee that the results are unbiased or the model is correct. If we do diagnostics, we can understand the source of misspecification and when we address it, the results might be different. Let's compare x3 and uh, this model here and the largest difference is between these two correlations again and it is only minus 4% difference. Here after dropping x3 that was kind of justified we started to do a, a bit more questionable things so that was more, more about data mining than theoretical justification. x7 may be justified but this was pure data mining. So uh, would it make a difference of whether we choose the first, the, the third model or the fifth model? Well, we need to understand if minus 4% is large and we need to contextualize what is a, a large difference. So there are a couple of things that we can consider as, in the, as context. Quite often in methodological research, when we analyze how different estimation strategies work in small samples, Typically we can prove that things are consistent 
but we cannot prove small sample behavior and in practice many of our estimation techniques are biased in small samples. Maximum likelihood estimates are biased in small samples. In methodological research we typically consider 5% bias to be trivial and we are okay with having 5% bias. If you think that 5% bias is too much then you pretty much shouldn't do anything with sample sizes in the hundreds using maximum likelihood because there is bias and, and that's just uh, simply something that you cannot avoid. So based on this consideration that I think that 5% bias is, is uh, trivial I'm going to be choosing uh, the model 3. So I'm going to be choosing that model and this is something that we did for diagnostics but we considered that the effects of dropping x7 and doing this data mining they did not change the results in a meaningful way therefore we are not going to be using these models. But it is important to show this as diagnostics. So how do we justify choosing a model 3? Well we first take a look at the residuals. In absolute sense does this model fit the data? We can see that the largest residual correlation is 0.049 that is very small and the average absolute correlation is 0.011. All the approximate fit indices also indicate extremely good fit. How do we justify choosing model 3? So this is what I wrote up. So if I were to report this analysis in a paper, I would write something like that. I would probably expand it a bit just to tell a bit about the details. So I'll put, I'll put an appendix to the paper just to explain what the exact uh, decisions were and how did I justify those decisions. But this justification or this explanation has, has some important elements. So we have the initial model test. So we have the starting point. The first model did not fit the data and then we need to explain the workflow of the diagnostics. So we perform the diagnostics uh, by um, doing two things. So we do residuals, modification indices and other empirical results. Those empirical results suggest modifications but they are not justifications for modifications. So the fact that you have a high modification index does not mean that you should actually do something about the model. It is just a suggestion by the computer that this is something that you should be looking at. So the item wordings justify the modifications. So whenever you look at whether you should be doing something, adding a correlation between x1 and x2 for example, then you need to uh, try to look at the wordings. Why do x1 and x2 correlate more with one another than what the model predicts? Then I applied bifactor models instead of correlated errors. And correlated errors are more common, but bifactor models are better because they force you to, to uh, be more explicit about the assumptions. At least you need to name the factor and, and when you've come up with a name for the factor, you need to think about what does that factor actually represent? What is the omitted common cause that the original model did not have? Then we dropped items and item dropping, it's important to understand that I did not do item dropping because some of the items were estimated to be less reliable than others. I dropped items because there was unmolar dimensionality in the scale and I couldn't come up with a clean and reasonable approach to model the dimensionality so therefore it was easy to just simplify the scale. Another important thing about item dropping is that the scale meaning should not change. So if we have items about uh, objective performance in tests and items about how do you believe that you do in a school subject, then dropping all the objective uh, items is going to be changing the meaning of the scale. So we need to uh, make sure that we actually get the general factor and not a combination of a general factor and a minor factor from the scale when we drop the items. Unless the minor factor is actually something that we're interested in. This, then we re-estimated the full model with these modifications we got a significant chi-square, we did some modifications, we again uh, dropped the cross-loading items and at this point it is important that you have at least three indicators per scale because otherwise the model becomes unstable for those factors with only two indicators because you need information from other parts of the model for identification. And again when we drop indicators we need to make sure that the scale meaning does not change. Then we need a uh, added error correlations but we can only do that kind of data mining when the effects are trivial. 
So this was simply to, uh, to show that we actually can get a chi-square and the, what we need to do is, is trivial. So we add small correlation 0.03 to the model and that makes the chi-square significant. Then uh, we do sensitivity analysis. So what would be the effect had we uh, gone full data mining and gotten the chi-square to, to go to non-significance? And if the difference is trivial, then we can conclude that the effect of the misspecification in the actual model that we chose is going to be trivial as well. If we data mine, there's research showing that by mo following modification indices, you are not going to be uh, ending up to the correct model. So you're basically going to be adding correlations that capitalize on chance and don't reflect the underlying population. So if you can have a more parsimonious model, and the results are not very different from, from the final model where, where you did data mining, then retaining the more parsimonious model is a better choice than going for the data mining model. Then we make a decision and we, we explain the justification. Now, the final thing, what's the point of doing this? So this is a lot of work. It took me uh, almost two full days at the office playing with this data, first getting the survey forms, trying to understand the different translations, how it was translated into Arabic, whether there was something in the translation process that uh, could have caused some dimensionality in the scales, how were they validated, that kind of thing, studying the scale, getting the items, then running all kinds of factor analysis of the model. I did some steps that I omitted here that I eventually chose not to use. So uh, some of the bifactor models that I tried are not including the model. So it's a lot of work. So what's the point? The point of this diagnostics is the understanding that misspecification. Because if your model is misspecified in a, in a serious way, in this case, the original model was pretty good. And even without any of these diagnostics, the original model and the final model were very close to one another in terms of results. So going for the first model would uh, not have been a big mistake. But the problem is that that is not guaranteed. So even if your CFI is more than 0 0.95, then it's possible that there are local misspecifications that affect one of the correlations a lot, but not others. And, and that would uh, still not be captured by CFI, but it would affect your results. So fitting this is going to reveal the nature of the problems and diagnostics and analysis of item wordings can reveal issues that can be addressed. For example, adding dimensionality to the scales. So, Doing diagnostics is important for the same reason as we do diagnostics for regression analysis. We need to do these things just to be uh, sure that the model is good for the data and the results are trustworthy. There is also another reason for doing this and uh, getting a, a significant chi-square is less important. It could be an objective and sometimes you need to go for it. And why would you want to go uh, for the significant chi-square? Well, one of the reasons is that you may have a co-author or you may have a reviewer who insists that models with non-significant chi-square are only models that, that should be published. And models with significant chi-square are should not be published because they are wrong. Well, with 6,000 observations, there are, the correlation between 0 0.04 is going to be statistically significant. So the same person is, is basically arguing that having a correlation of 0 0.04 is going to be meaningful. Of course, in, in smaller samples, there is uh, lots, of, lots more leeway, lots more um, room for, for sampling variation in the chi-square. But with 6,000 observations, we need to uh, get the model almost exactly correct to get the significant chi-square. Another thing is that uh, the final two steps in the model, dropping X7, and adding uh, correlations in, in full data mining mode by uh, adding these very trivial correlations, it did not change the result at all. So there's minus 4% difference in one correlation. In other factor correlations, the differences were in the third digit. So doing those extra steps wouldn't make a difference. So if a reviewer tells me to do something that does not make a difference for my end result, I might just well do it. It does not compromise the quality of the research. And uh, final thing is that the chi-square is not a valid test anyway when used this way. 
So the, when you do a chi-square test and then you uh, modify the model based on your result, for example dropping an indicator based on an empirical result and then you uh, run, test the same model, test the modified model using the data. Then you are building the model partially on that data and then testing the same model with the data. So the, the test basically becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So this is a similar problem that you have in a stepwise regression analysis. So when you're building uh, the model based on data and then you're testing the same, using the same data for testing the model, then the model test is not valid because the test and the model are not independent. And then final thing is that the non-significant chi-square does not guarantee that the model is correct for two reasons. One is that uh, it is possible that you just simply capitalized on chance. So, so you added a correlation that happened to be there by chance only and then some correlations that existed in the population happened to be small in the sample and then you did not model those. So it's possible that we simply model sampling error instead of modeling something that existed in the population. Another thing is that there is the uh, possibility of covariance, covariance equivalent models. So it's possible that another model would have explained the data equally well. So the point about diagnostics is about revealing problems and addressing them if you can, not about achieving a particular result such as a non-significant chi-square. If you can get the non-significant chi-square using theory-based modification, that's nice but that's not always achievable.